order to the meeting of the Rapid County Planning Commission, our regular meeting for March 2021, dates March 17th. Happy St. Patrick's Day, and thanks to everyone for wearing a mask, which we all appreciate. If you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And I forgot to uh, call the order. Uh, there are seven for anyone who's, is there Zoom tonight? Zoom is live. Okay, if anyone is participating by Zoom for the record, um, we have seven members on the Planning Commission. All are present, including Mr. Shul, Mr. Kohler, Mr. Sharp, Ms. Ishi, Mr. Light, Mr. Henry, and me. I'm Keir Whitson. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> next order of business is to adopt the agenda. I will note that the Vitali special use permit application that we reviewed initially at our last meeting um, remains incomplete vis-a-vis -vis our request for follow-up on whether or not the road meets the road standards set forth in the quote-unquote May amendment. So with that, I would entertain a motion to amend tonight's agenda to strike the to further discussion of the Vitali special use permit application under old business. I, can I ask a question about that? I, I was uh, uncertain about when we have on the agenda old business, does that mean that that's, I, I don't have any objection to striking it for the reasons you stated. I just wondered, that's an informational question, what old business means in terms of our handling an item. I don't know if anybody it's knows. It's been visited before. This, so it's does been that, addressed before, so it's not a new item. So, it, but it doesn't. But it means we could address it at, at no, this meeting. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. A motion to strike that one item from our agenda. I'll make the motion. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Sharp made the motion. Second. Uh, second for Mr. Kohler. Any further discussion? And Mr. Curry, procedurally, is there anything you want to add about the characterization of old business? Nope. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. The agenda is now amended. Um, next is the adoption of the minutes. And if you'll just bear with me for a moment. In January, we tabled uh, at our organizational meeting the adoption of minutes for the December 29th Planning Commission meeting, which was a pretty lengthy meeting. Ms. Ishii had eight specific edits, and I promised, and last night went ahead and listened or watched the video of the December meeting, and if you all take my word for it, I was able to corroborate that um, her, her suggested replacement paragraphs, primarily for where she spoke and where certain members of the public spoke, are in line with the substance of what was actually said in the video recording. So that's the December 29th minute, so I would entertain a motion uh, to adopt those minutes as amended. And if we all agree, I'll, I'll provide this to uh, Marlena Lee, who will then make the changes for the record. Move to adopt the minutes as, as uh, amended. I'll and second. Mr. Kohler made that motion, and Mr. Light, I believe, seconded it. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very much. The next set of minutes, um, both Ms. Ishii and I had some minor um, Non-substantive edits. These are for our, bear with me here. <clears throat> These are for our uh, February 17th uh, meeting. There was a number of spelling errors, particularly of names of participants in the meeting. And I did review Miss Ishii's edits. And if, again, if you take my word for it, I, I assure you they're not substantive. I would entertain a motion to adopt these minutes for February 17th with the non-substantive edits that I have in hand and that I've reviewed. So moved. Second. Mr. Kohler made the motion. Mr. Light seconded. Any discussion? Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. And finally, I want to thank uh, Ms. Lee for her great work on the minutes. Those were some pretty involved meetings, and you did a great job of keeping track of the details. So thank you for your hard work. I'd like to echo that. Um, I've taken minutes before, and I know it's a thankless task um, because somebody's always catching minor things. So thanks for all your work in that, Marlena. Great. Thank you very much. Um, 
we have no public hearings tonight scheduled, so we will just have a public comment period. Does anybody wish to speak during the public comment period? Okay, great. If you could just keep your comments to about five minutes, we'd appreciate that. I'll go ahead and open the public comment period. And if you just state your name, I think we all know you and where you reside in Rappahannock County, go from there. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Margaret Bond. I live in the Piedmont District. I'm here to speak on behalf of the first item of your new business, which is the tourist home application for Nick Dowling Real Estate, LLC. Um, my interest in this property uh, and the tourist home application is that I board some horses on this property, the Blue Rock Farm property. The barn operation is down the same road that accesses the house, the tourist house in question. Um, and is sort of behind the property that you're, the main property that you're looking at tonight. Um, the, uh, I've been boarding for about five years, so I've had a chance to go down that road past that house that's in question, the one to become a tourist home, for about five years. Uh, I understand that the condition of the property existed um, as I first found it for maybe five or six years prior to that, which was no, no activity at all. The house there had a roof on it, it had some exterior walls, it had um, a lot of open windows and a lot of birds living in the house. It was no landscaping, no, no um, uh, uh, public drain, or drain field or anything like that. So it's basically a non-usable piece of property and the inn itself, Blue Rock Inn, was also not functioning. So for five years, this is what had went on. But two years ago, um, Nick Dowling came along and he had a vision for this property. Many people had looked at it and, and passed on, but he had a vision for the property and the vision included renovating this, this house and making it part of his whole operation, including the Blue Rock Inn. The, uh, not only did he have a vision, but he uh, executed on that vision and he, he um, went ahead and put a lot of time and energy and money into that particular house and brought it back to life, really. Uh, I've seen every day I go past that. In fact, I think my car is even in one of the pictures in your packet there <laughs> um, as I, I traveled to the barn area beyond that. And he, the vision here has um, really brought life back to the property. It's the vision not only for this tourist home, but for the Blue Rock Inn itself, they are complementary uh, businesses. And as I see it, it's, um, it the house is very lovely. It's, it has lots of windows. It has an architecture which is very much in keeping with what you see in, in Rappahannock County. It has a lovely wraparound porch and views of the, you know, the Blue Ridge Mountains and so forth. And it's kind of situated in a way you don't see it really from the road. So the, the visual impact is not, not great on the uh, rest of the county. But the vision also includes a way to bring tourist business to Rappahannock County. It brings business for, um, for tax purposes um, to the, the county for the rooms that he proposes to use to, uh, for his tourist home and, of course, for the, uh, for the inn itself. And for that reason, I think it's, it's a very, very positive uh, addition to Rappahannock County, and I hope you will consider it favorably in that it, it, it revives and makes the property itself much more useful. Uh, it brings tax dollars to the uh, to the operation. It brings tourists to to Rappahannock County and to Sperryville and and so forth. So there's a lot of positives to this uh, use of the property as it's proposed. And I've I've gone through that packet too, and and I've seen how he proposes to use the property, and it's it's coming along very nicely. Um, a lot of pluses to approving of this property. In fact, the only the only person I can think of that negatively impacts is me because it's going to be a lot more traffic down that one road that uh, ultimately leads to the barn. But I think overall it's a very positive addition to the county and I hope you'll consider it favorably. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mark Anderson from the Piedmont District. I dare not disagree with the previous speaker, but I would like to supplement what she said a little bit. Uh, the zoning staff report that you have in your packet is accurate as far as it goes, but there's more to the story, as you might guess. Uh, one of the questions I had is why the building permit was issued in 2005 and the property is still not complete. It, it bothered me anyway. And I know the reason, because this property is, the entire property, the 80 acres, has changed hands at least four times in the last 10 years. Every operator of the inn has basically gone broke. 
trying to make that thing a viable enterprise. And the reason to me, I'm not a lodging expert or anything, but the reason it is is there's only five bedrooms in the um, main lodge, the main inn. So you need to have extra bedrooms to have enough people to make it a viable business. Uh, Mr. Dowling's vision was to utilize the semi-complete structure for this other house to house more rooms, have those people go to the inn for their meals and everything else, and thus make it a viable operation. And he's already spent a ton of money uh, to complete that house, to get the septic drain field that is going to be required installed and all of that. I, I hesitate to guess how much money it is. During the five years we've been here, uh, I have talked to several distinguished realtors about what to be done with that house. We have a distinguished realtor here, but that wasn't one of the ones I spoke with. Uh, the problem is it was halfway done. It's what they call in Northern Virginia a teardown. It, it's, it it's, was in real danger of having to be destroyed. In some counties, there would have been abatement proceedings for it as a public nuisance because nothing happened for 15 years, almost 16 now, I guess. Uh, in any event, and when there was discussion with the fire and rescue about using it for a tr practice burn house, which obviously would have destroyed the value, although it would have been fun. Um, anyway, none of that happened. Uh, at the time, Mr. Dowling took over. It was They had a good roof. It was framed in. Um, had a good floor and foundations and everything, but nothing else had been done. So it was roughly halfway, maybe not even quite halfway done. And he's got it very close to being complete. Um, but for it to really go, for the in operation to succeed and everything, he needs to get those uh, tourist home designations on, uh, what is he asking for, five bedrooms? And that makes the whole thing viable, and, it, and hopefully he won't be another operator of that property that ends up having going broke and having to shut it down. Um, I've heard eloquently from Mr. Whitson about the need for more lodging and restaurant revenues for taxes, you will get that from this property. They have not sold a meal out of the Blue Rock Inn since 2014, by my estimation, and I don't think they've had any lodging since before then. Uh, this is all coming together to where it will be back in operation, I believe, within a year. So I really hope that you can see your way clear to approve this uh, special use permit for these bedrooms in this structure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Anyone else uh, want to speak? Um, is there anybody participating by Zoom, Mr. Curry? Uh, Ms. Hardy is online. Sure okay. Any, any additional participants from the Zoom platform? Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll close the public comment period. Appreciate your remarks. Okay, at the outset of the meeting, we did amend the agenda, so we will now move on to new business and um, already a familiar topic this evening. Um, this is a special use permit application. Actually, I, um, Ms. Sonnet is here. Uh, if I could entertain a motion to just switch the order of, of the two new business items, I think this the second one probably will go more quickly than the first. You mean one that becomes the yeah? I'd like to I'd like to switch um, the SUP permit um, for Dowling with uh, the the Sonnet SUP permit application. I'll make that motion. Okay, Mr. Sharp made the motion. I'll second. Ms. Ishii seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Okay. Ms. Sonnet, um, why don't we first, I'll, we'll just ask uh, Ms. Summers to summarize this, and then if you have anything you want to say about your application. Ms. Summers? Thank you. Sonnet's a proposal at Hustle Sawmill with property located at 850 Harris Hollow Road. For 17036 G, the property is 166 acres in size. The sawmill is portable that, that will solve all harvested from the property. More values will follow up and be brought onto the property for custom milling. It is anticipated two to three average additional trips daily beyond the current number generated from the farm and the use of the property outside of paying lean employee trips. Anticipated customer visits would be minimal. 
He now has indicated an email after looking at the entrance and based on a conversation with the owners, they feel that the entrance was acceptable. The health department has been contacted for comments, um, but none has been received from them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Sonnet, do you want to provide some context for the application or anything you want to add? Um, let me just say that I did speak directly with Medge at the health department and she saw no um, issues that would involve the health department. Um, the operation is in smack dab in the middle of the woods uh, on an old uh, timbering clearing. And um, at this point, the operation is a bandsaw on a trailer and a tractor. Uh, so uh, not much in the way of, of business or, or activity. Um, and it will be, um, I don't imagine it would go beyond two of my boys uh, cutting timber there. Okay, great. Would you mind if we open it to questions? If anyone, uh, does anyone have any questions for Ms. Sonnet? Well, I mean, it's mostly wood off the property, but not limited to wood off the property. Correct. <clears throat> Correct. If someone has a fallen tree and they ask to have it specifically cut in a certain way, we would bring it to the property and cut it and take it back. If I could, Mr. Chairman, I guess, I guess I'd like to clarify one passage in the, um, I guess this is the staff report, under other agency comments, there's reference, uh, it's not clear, I guess this is associated with something shared with VDOT. The owner stated no commercial use, they would only be cutting timber for their property to repair barns, buildings on their property. At some point in the future, they may cut a log or two for a couple of friends, but not run a lumber yard. So I guess I'm wondering, I, I, from, the, from the application, it seems like you had some commercial use in mind. Certainly that would be allowed if we granted that, but I, I'm, I guess I'm just wondering what to make of that, that part of the staff report. Is that accurate, that you're not even planning to do this commercially, in which case I'm not even sure why we're here? Uh, it's simply within the context of the uh, custom sawmill uh, application, which I believe allows for a certain amount of uh, commercial work, um, but it's going to be quite small in scale. Okay, so so even though your intention now is limited as stated under other comments, you're asking for uh, the approval of the use as as per the definition of a custom sawmill, which would clearly would allow more use than you currently plan. Is that it would allow, yes. Yeah. Yes. I just want to make that clear. I found those two passages a little confusing. Um, I guess I'm a, it's, it's, when you read the proposed request, it, it, it kind of shuffles around in here. And uh, it seems that there's a, a lot of avenues here that are left open to, to future expansion. Uh, at first, it starts off that the sawmill will be used to saw logs, harvest, and harvest it from the property. And then, next sentence, more valuable saw logs may be brought onto the property for custom milling. And, and then it says, uh, anticipated two or three more average trips daily. Uh, will be generated, um, and you got up to five employees here um, for the proposed operation as it's presented. So, yeah. I think you can only harvest property, you can only harvest timber for so long on 166 acres until you reach a point where you really don't have anything else to harvest on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, has there been timber cut on the property in the last 25 years? Yes. Yeah. So, on a very limited basis. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just concerned about this kind of being a box, Pandora's box here, that's going to be opened up later. Um, and the custom sawmill operation, um, you know, does that mean that a large uh, axle truck will be bringing in, you know, 25 logs? to be dropped off? Uh, will that mean that uh, y'all gonna be cutting 
clubs that people are going to come up and buy the boards every day or two, whether they're fencing boards or boards for something else. Um, you know, I guess there's one thing for VDOT to, to look at um, the entrance for a 16-foot trailer and a, and a three-quarter ton truck, but I think it's something else different if, if the trucks are increased in size and how those trucks will come to the site. Because when you come up Get Brown Hollow, as you know, it, it gets pretty narrow as you approach your property. Harrison. Yeah. Well, I'm coming up and Get Brown to get oh. to the top there. Oh, okay. okay. I'm sure it's narrow on your side, but it's a little bit wider on your side mm. there. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's issues here that, uh, uh, that we need to address and, and try to put controls on. Uh, there's a number of these small band saws around the county and people use them on their property and they move them around to job sites to do custom work at the job sites and they've never been a problem but uh, I just don't and I understand maybe what you're trying to do but I'm not sure I understand what you're trying to do I just don't want to leave this open to where you could have increases to a, a larger uh, size operation with a bigger mill going all the way up to five people selling lumber uh, there on a daily basis. So that's that's concerns that I have. I understand. And actually, that would be a concern of mine. I would not want it to be that size of an operation. Well, you're going to have to define this and word this better, I okay. think. You know. Okay. Can I circle back to you before it goes to the BZA with that kind of... Uh, 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 rewording. I think we'll we'll talk about that some more. Yeah. So the the process is that this is really a preliminary review of the application. So you can you you can supplement it, provide more information, and then we could we could address it, we could look at it again. Okay. At um, another and, meeting. Yeah. Of the correct. Commission. Sure. Okay. Yep. And at that point, we can either um, send it on to the BZA without having a public hearing at the Planning Commission mm -hmm. with a recommendation for approval or denial or with no recommendation. Mm -hmm. Or we can schedule a public hearing if we feel like the, the application rises to a level where there are planning-related issues that, that should be addressed before this body. So um, we could either just move it on to the BZA with a complete picture of what you're planning. Mm -hmm. If that led us to a conclusion that we could make a clear recommendation to the BZA or or again, if if it seemed like we we really wanted to wrestle with it a bit here from a planning perspective, then we'd schedule a public hearing here. The BZA has to have a public hearing in any event. Yeah. Um, so it, you know, it's it, it's a question of whether or not you'd have to go through one here and there, or only there. Um, but certainly, you'd have an opportunity to better define this um, between between now and. In our next meeting, okay. and I guess my only question, and um, you could you could address it and follow up with Miss Summers if you want. You don't have to uh, to discuss it now. But I was just curious where what the origin of this plan was and the the sawmill idea and where it came. Why why you're pursuing this? Is it well the fact that we're a tree farm? Okay, um, and it's a kind of a logical progression mm -hmm. to have our own sawmill. I got uh, and to um, we've got ash dying right and yeah. left. Uh, it's a good uh, building material. Um, we can use it ourselves. We have uh, requests through associations with my uh, sons for ash siding for a specific sure. uh, job here or there. And that was basically how it grew out. Because they're working a lot in the county, right? Yeah. Almost exclusively, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What happens when the ash? What happens when you exhaust your 166 acre of timber supply? And it will be exhausted. It will, but we're talking about a couple of trees a month, basically, uh, is the volume that I see for the foreseeable future. Um, if there are other uh, logs of a similar nature that can be brought in and cut for the same purpose or potentially a piece of cherry or a piece of walnut that someone would like to have cut specifically. Uh, one of my sons is actually getting into woodworking himself. What you just said doesn't match your application. Okay. I thought there was indication in there that we would be potentially bringing in logs from the outside. Yeah. Uh, it, it, 
if I if I may, I think part of the confusion is the definition of of custom mill clearly imagines and allows for a much more significant operation than that which you're sort of implying you're interested in. So we're just trying to understand are we by by approving this in its current form, it would seem we're accepting anything that you could do with that up to five. And so we would just want to clarify what you're really asking for and make sure that if whatever we recommend approval of or or not is consistent with what you really have in mind. So we're not making a decision based on under or overestimating what you're doing. That's okay. really all we're trying to do, I think. Okay. I, I think I understand what you're saying. And my comment would be um, the potential now and the potential to grow into something that would not be any greater than your definition for custom sawmill uh, in the future. Um, I think it would take many years to get there, but I would not want to come back to you at a later date and say, we're getting bigger, can right. we redo this, <clears throat> unless that's the way you'd like us to handle it. Um, I understand, but I think that's where Mr. Henry's concern comes in, that you know, if that's the case, then from our perspective, since we're not going to get another look at it, then we basically need to look at it in its full full form uh, in order to make the decision. So okay. it is your it is your choice to decide, you know, what you ask for at what time. Okay. We, we certainly understand that, but I think you should probably see that we need to know what we're recommending approval of in order to do that. And, and from what's been said, I would think that we need to look at it in its full uh, maximized capacity, which brings up the concerns that Mr. Henry has raised. Okay. Yeah, and I, th I mean, you're my neighbors, and I know your sons, so I, th I think I already have a fairly good sense of where you're, where you're headed with this in my own mind, but other people don't have the luxury of kind of knowing who you all are and what your sons in particular do in the county. So that might be a good way to further refine refine the application, kind of the scope of your plan is just put it in into that context. Okay. Um, who would be who would be operating it and sort of capacity and production level, all that stuff. Okay. All right, so um, I would then revise what I have given you in the way of the scope of the operation and submit that to Michelle? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, all right, and then potentially come back to you for the next planning commission yep. meeting um, if it were deemed to be something that would have to be discussed here again. And if not, it would just go straight on to the BZA, is that correct? Well, I think that depends on what our next action is on what we could decide to do. It's, uh, I think that in addition to the options you mentioned, we could decide to do a hearing on it and ask that, that she have those materials right. for the hearing. So yeah. I do think there's a, the next steps are sort of to be determined based on what we choose to do at this point. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, does anybody remember one of the last applications for a sawmill in the county was? Nope. There you go. Henry Diggs on uh, 637. Didn't uh, Taylor, Bill Taylor, got one? He, I don't know. He had one, but I don't know whether he came in for a permit. But yeah, the, he did. He got a permit for that. I don't think he ever used it. He's, yeah, he's got Is that on his brother's property? He's got a significant operation there on old, is it either Old Hollow or, you know, he built a building and he, he does probably a lot of what you're thinking about. Yeah. Well, Henry Diggs did one down in Amosville in 637, and uh, it, it's, it's, its proposal was very similar to this, uh, a more sizable operation. And uh, there was uh, a large amount of public input, uh, pro and con, for that at the time. Um, so, you know, wood products can be an item that people get concerned about. Uh, we had a, a wood product application some years ago down here on, on Benvenu Road that some neighbors didn't like. So this property here is at the top of a holler where you either come in through it from 211 or you come through the town of Little Washington. So I, I think we got to think about the wider world of, of impact here and, and what we're doing. So, and what Mr. Light was just suggesting is we could, one option would be just to schedule a public hearing for our April meeting 
because if we we'll determine this in a minute, but if we t if we just table it now, you can come back in April, and then we we could end up if there was interest in doing so, schedule a public hearing, which would delay it until May. So, uh, and then that, then after that, it would go on to the BZA following the public hearing. So, one possibility would be to schedule this for a public hearing in April, and then between now and then, you go ahead and refine the scope and what you're seeking. Um, particularly with respect to kind of your your uh, contemplated production output capacity, road usage, where it fits with sort of your family's plans going forward, those types of things. Okay. All right. Well, I welcome that. That's fine. Okay. I have just one question, just maybe it'll help. But is the main issue the trap, the trucks coming in and out? Is that... I think I think it's it's all these things, whether it's it's the the size of the mill, the, the, the noise level, it's it's the trucks coming in, and you know whether it's custom work coming in with trucks or they're or they're anticipating cutting their logs, and how many people are going to be coming in per day or per week to to buy the material, uh, whether they're going to go to a bigger machine later, uh, what size entrance can the do they uh, uh, need to uh, put the trucks coming in? You know, a pickup truck with a log on it is completely different than a, a big storage, log truck storage, all these things. I think it's important. Okay. Um, I think it was mentioned in the application that, and as I've said here earlier, the property has been logged in the past. Oh, that's uh, why and, I'm saying that you only have so was, much more timber left. Anybody can log their property, and you log it for a week or a month or two months, and then another 10, 20 years, 30 years later, some people only log one time in a generation. Mm -hmm. So because you cut logs 20 years ago or five years ago, what you're talking about doing now is a continuous cut until you exhaust whatever material you have. And then you're going to have, if you're going to stay there, you're going to have to get your material from someplace else. To your point of uh, the traffic going in and out, yeah. the reason I brought the fact that we have timbered in the past is the driveway and the access onto Harris Hollow uh, or Gid Brown was handled by uh, significant timber trucks, and this was back in the 70s, um, and there hasn't been significant timber trucks like that going in and out since then, but the existing uh, entrance and the existing road uh, supported what was done those years ago. Um, so, uh, so do, is it? I, mean, I think the public has an input to know whether or not in that rural, remote area, whether when you run out of logs and you have to get your logs someplace else, find them. I'm sure you're going to go for quantity and quality when you purchase them. Do they want a, a truck coming in, a big truck coming in once a week, once every two weeks? You know, I think these are things you ask now instead of. You know, have complaints ten years down the road. Yeah, if, if I may, I, I might can't make the same point slightly differently. We're not we're not talking about your right to timber it. Mm -hmm. That is, and the truckage associated with that. That is clearly part of the agricultural use. The reason this is a separate use request is the operation of the mill and the additional activities that could mean, with respect to additional people, possibly even retail customers, employees for a permanent place, and the, the bringing in of, of, of uh, supply wood. So I think that's the distinction. We're not, I mean, if we were just talking about your, your timber operation, I don't, again, I don't know that we'd even be here. Okay. Any other questions? I, I don't have any questions. I, I, I agree with what's been said. It's just a question of refining what you're asking for would be very helpful, I think. Um, but I do, um, you know, more sawmills in the county is not a bad idea, in my opinion. I, my own, you know, I know plenty of folks who need more more log sawed, but um, yeah, it would be helpful to have defined what what exactly you want. So thank you for okay. helping us out on that. Um, does anybody want to uh, put forward a motion either way on how you want to address this? I think we I put forth a motion that we uh, uh, have the applicant come back with a refined plan and advertise this for a public hearing in April. I second that. Okay, uh, Mr. Henry made the motion and Mr. Shulman. Mr. Shulman seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. So it's it'll be scheduled for a public hearing at our April meeting. Okay. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. But just go ahead and work directly with Michelle on refining the scope, and and this way we'll move along and okay. make a decision in April and move it on to the PCA. So Great. thank you. Thank you all Thanks for your a lot. time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, all right, the now second item under new business, this is a special use permit application 21-02-01 Dowling Real Estate LLC. Uh, this is a special use permit application for a tourist home. And Ms. Summers, if you would just walk us through um, the bottom line on the application and what you know so far, and we, we'll go from there. Thank you. Dowling on behalf of Dowling Real Estate LLC wishes to use the existing home which is currently under construction as a five bedroom forest home. This property currently has a special exception from it, 870407 and 921002 to operate a lodging resort with 10 rooms for overnight lodging and banquet facilities. It also has a special use permit, 051202, for this specific dwelling which is um, the second dwelling on the property and that it not be used for commercial. This house was intended to be the residence of the Blue Rocks, former owners, and not used in conjunction with the inn for transient occupancy, unless an amendment was made to that permit. The health department noted that a septic system was permitted um, as of June 17, 2020, for seven bedrooms and has not been final. And Mr. Brown is here to represent the applicant. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will let that uh, Nick Dowling is, has joined the Zoom. Great. Uh, okay. Mr. Great. Dow, I knew that he was uh, going to try and join us by um, uh, on, on Zoom this evening. Um, uh, just very briefly, I won't rehash the application materials uh, that uh, that you all have in front of you. Um, um, unexpectedly, uh, Ms. Bond and Mr. Anderson uh, probably gave you a better summary uh, of the history of this structure, uh, the specific structure that we're dealing with in this application that, that I could have. Um, uh, Ms. Summers' uh, staff report mentions uh, that uh, there was there's an existing special use permit uh, that uh, Mr. Harvey, I believe, actually had to get uh, when he constructed this structure um, uh, that, that had, a, uh, had language in it that, that provided that there was no, to be no commercial use. And that was based upon, I think, his representation uh, that the reason he was building this structure uh, was it, that, that they were going to live in it and, and, and operate the, the Blue Rock Inn structure, which is over on a different part uh, of the property. Uh, uh, Mr. Goff and Ms. Summers and I have had a, have sort of an exchange of emails about that and wh whether the sort of the, the fundamental question of whether that uh, somehow precludes uh, the current owner, Mr. Dowling, now coming in uh, and uh, making this application uh, and seeking a tourist home use. Um, uh, my position, it will surprise none of you, uh, is that the, that doesn't preclude uh, the, the current application that's in front of you. In, in fact, uh, that it's the, you know, the, the condition that appears in that, uh, I think, uh, is, is, is exactly what the board, uh, when they issued that, had in mind, is that at some point in the future, uh, an owner could come forward uh, and go through the appropriate process uh, of seeking a special use permit uh, for a tourist home transient occupancy use. Um, uh, I, uh, I don't know uh, what, else, what, else, what other motivation they, they might have had uh, in, in uh, putting, that, uh, uh, putting that restriction in there. Um, so but you have before you then uh, this current uh, application for tourist home use. Uh, the photographs uh, that are in the application materials were taken about a month ago. Uh, so they are, uh, 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 construction has progressed uh, since then. Um, w one note, uh, by way of an amendment uh, to, the, uh, to the application that you have, is that the application itself was filed uh, uh, late in January uh, of this year. Uh, before the uh, May amendments uh, were uh, were approved, uh, so the application itself uh, makes reference to uh, seeking approval for seven uh, guest rooms. Uh, of course, uh, that uh, that should be now uh, deemed to be amended to conform uh, to the uh, to the May amendments, so that it would be uh, five rooms, a uh, maximum of ten, 
uh, occupancy of occupants two to each room. Um, I, like I said, I, I, won't, I won't take up the commission's time in rehashing the other materials you have in front of you. I'm sure you've, you've had an opportunity to review them, but I am happy uh, to answer any questions that the uh, commissioners may have. I have one. Thank you very much, Mr. Short. Go ahead. Um, so they will rent the rooms out separately to different people? Uh, at this point, the, 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 the health department uh, materials indicate that the, the structure would be uh, rented as, 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 as one structure. Um, uh, you know, to one, and one group or one. That's correct. So yes, not sir. parceled out. That's correct. That's correct. The, 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 the Blue Rock Inn itself. Um, uh, which uh, Mr. Dowling intends to, uh, is working in earnest to make operational. Uh, and in fact, uh, this commission uh, will have before it an, an application uh, related to that probably as early as next month. We hope to get it filed this month. Um, you know, that's a different situation. You know, they're, they're in, the, in that lodging and in uh, situation, of course, those rooms will be, you know, uh, will be let on, a, on an individual basis. But you know, the tourist home use, um, you know, I, Although there's no specific uh, prohibition on it uh, in our ordinance, uh, I think uh, implicitly assumes that it's a it's it's a rental by the structure, and and as I said, there's a there's a mention of this in the health department uh, application where there's that that, that is uh, that it'll be it'll be by the structure, not by the room. The, uh, Mr. Brown, the, uh, the plat that we have shows that it's a, uh, it has lines for three parcels. Right. But it's still one parcel. Yeah, it is still one parcel at this point. Uh, that is, that uh, plat, I went ahead and attached it to these application materials just for the purpose of, of, the, of the Planning Commission and the BZA being able to picture where this structure is on the current Blue Rock property. But as of right now, it is one 79 and a half acre parcel. Part of the application uh, for the amendments to the special exception permit that we'll be filing it is going to seek the approval uh, of being allowed to subdivide the property consistent with the, with the subdivision ordinance. That, the, the reason for that is because, again, in, in one of the special exception permits that was issued, I want to say the one that was done in 1992, um, the board uh, put a restriction in there that that's basically stated that the property uh, could only be subdivided by by way of a future amendment to the to the permit. So at this point, that part the property has not been subdivided. Uh, that is the concept. It's not. It's no secret. We'll be coming forward with that in the in the um, application for the amendment to the SEP. Thank you. And will the uh, the driveway that serves this house serve the back lot as well? Um, at this point, there's a uh, we're still thinking about sort of the ultimate design. I mean, the I think the, the best way of putting it is that this driveway would, would be intended to serve the barn structures that you see over on the left hand side of that back lot. That's where uh, a, a large part of the yeah the equestrian uh, activity occurs in those barns. You can and uh, you can see it in one of the photographs in, in the materials. Um, it 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 makes sense then for that. For that driveway to serve that use on that end of that parcel, there will be a separate uh, driveway uh, that accesses again. Assuming this is all assuming that the that the uh, the request is approved, if the lot is approved and laid out that way, uh, there's a there's a separate um, right of way. If, if I if I I'm going to come over here. This Blue Rock property also has the benefit of another right of way that comes in, it's shown mm -hmm. here on this plant, that comes in, it's behind the, uh, I guess that's Christmas Tree Lane. It is, it's yep. Behind uh, uh, Massey's and, and goes back in there. This property has the right to use that right of way. So the plan, ultimately, if approved, will be that this parcel to access these, uh, the dwelling over here, would be off of that right of way. So you wouldn't have a right of way cutting up through this. The property like that, but I think it's going to it's going to make sense for the equestrian part to still have the, the ability to come out this driveway here. Okay. Uh, how many how many acres approximately is what's currently showing there as parcel two? Uh, they are each roughly twenty five acres. I, I want to say they in that draw again. This 
This is just a drawing that the surveyor, we have not had it formally surveyed at this point to, to, to know exactly the acreage. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of additional acreage in the parcel one, the piece that, that the Blue Rock Inn itself mm -hmm. would sit on. Um, so probably about uh, 20, 28 or 29 acres in that parcel and uh, roughly 25 in each of the other two. And then there would be a house built on the behind the Blue Rock on that bottom right piece. It looks like there's one up above. The, uh, the only the only plan for that uh, for that parcel is the relocation. It's hard to see, but when you go out to the Blue Rock property, there's a there's a caretaker cottage. Mm -hmm. that's this, and, and and part of that application speaks to that they want to relocate this. Basically, take that caretaker. Caretaker <laughs> there and, and actually basically rebuild it over there in that spot. So it, 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 it would be a, it would be a new it would be the replacement of an existing mm. uh, uh, accessory dwelling on that property to a different location on the property. It would presumably be larger. I'm sorry. Presumably larger. Than uh, on the little now. I, I think there's a, a, a little bit larger, but not by much. There, there's not a plan to majorly expand that. And, and the future septic tank, that's the future septic field, I'm just trying to see what does that go to? That big circle, future septic field expansion, what right. is that there, for? There, there is, again, in, in the ultimate uh, special exception permit uh, amendment that will be coming forward, the, the proposal will be ultimately uh, for uh, a, a phased in uh, upward limit of uh, 25 rooms on the Blue Rock Inn property. Um, that will be on the basis of several small structures that, that, are, that are built down near the existing Blue Rock Inn structure itself, which is that, in fact why the, that caretaker cottage needs to be moved and relocated. And, and the expectation is from a, from a um, uh, a, a, a septic and drain field standpoint is that we're going to need additional um, additional septic and drain field capacity for those additional rooms uh, at that time. I was wondering, isn't the country in limited to 20 rooms? Is that the category you're talking about? Wow. I think, I think we're getting yeah. off onto a different application yeah. that doesn't yeah. exist. Yeah, well, that's true. Well, that's true. That's true. You know? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So for this application, right. We're looking at this one house that is currently determined to be a residence, not for commercial purposes. Is this an amendment to that original letter from John McCarthy and that, that zoning? Uh, or how are we handle it? I, I, I thought yeah, it was more. I thought it was more accurate to simply file it as a whole new special use permit, uh, rather than treat it as some kind of an amendment to that to that old. One. Does the, the special exception permit that was issued, though, presumably tracks with the property as a whole, right? I mean, it's the special exception permit. I, I don't believe there's any limiting language in it as far as it okay. only apply to that, that owner, like we sometimes see in special mm -hmm. use permits. So there may even be a copy of that in, yeah, in okay. the staff report. I don't think but, it has any limiting Yeah, I think language. I saw it. Yeah. So, so all the prior documents that were special use permits, whatever, that the, the DCA or the Planning Commission did in reference to this the, the item of tonight's discussion, they have no relevance to, to what we have here, either uh, because of the time lapse that this building was not completed in, in, in the two-year period. It was never finished, so anything really, from that standpoint, has become void and really, you don't, you're not standing on anything that was created. This is all simply a new application. And, and so, that's, yes, sir. And that's in fact, background my background right. was left out. Right. It would not have been any misrepresentation of what's tonight. Yeah. This application, what you have, stands on its own completely tonight. It's a, it's a new, new owner, new application. Right. That, that's correct. And that's why we, yeah. that, that's a, a main part of the reason why we thought that. stuff is just a background noise. Right, right. right. I, I'm, not, right. I'm, not, I'm not so sure about that. Um, maybe you can correct my misunderstanding here, but you referred to the earlier special use permit, but the, the, pink, the thing that's in the record is the special exception uh, permit. Uh, 
I, and I probably misspoke, it, the, because you know, for the the requirement under our zoning ordinance is if you're going to have more than one dwelling on a parcel, it's by special exception. Getting I special probably exception. Uh, misspoke. So, I so the, no, I think you the, said you said, said it correctly. The, yeah. the approval. Well, I think that's an important distinction. I'll get to that in a minute. But the approval that was granted to build this house is the one that is the the special exception that was granted, and it had the condition of no commercial use as a condition of allowing the second dwelling to be built. So it seems to me that we got the cart before the horse, that if we're, you need to deal with the fact that the special exception limits the use of this house to non-commercial before we can be entertaining uh, uh, the, the, the use of, a, of the house as a tourist home. It's, I, I don't understand, I mean, it seems odd to me that you've got this big plan for a special exception permit and You've come in first with this little piece that is all kind of tied up in the other stuff, and it, and it it's, seems odd to me. And it, you know, I wonder what's really going on. Um, th there's no mystery to it, Mr. Light, other than that the the, the requirement for a tourist home transient lodging, uh, transient occupancy permit is by a special use permit, um, and there is no special use permit that applies to this structure at this time. Uh, so again, sort of rational, you know, sort of reasoning through how it needed to be approached. The the approach was, you know, we were going to file the special use permit for this structure for transient uh, lodging purposes, but we're also going to have um, uh, a, a a major sort of uh, amendment to the existing special exception permit for the Blue Rock property. Again, that uh, that's a separate permit from the one that was done in 2006, uh, requested by Mr. Harvey when he built this built this structure. Uh, could, could you address the fact that the special exception that allowed the construction of this house had a no commercial use well, limitation on it and well, how, that, how, you're, how you're not restricted by that? Uh, I, again, I, 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 we, you met Ms. Summers and Mr. Goff and I have had an exchange of emails about it. Uh, my position is that it's a, you know, again, that was a condition to that special exception permit that the board, for whatever reason, uh, found appropriate at that time. It may have been based upon the representations of the app that the applicant was making uh, at the time. It may have been based on other conditions. I, I don't know. I don't know the specifics of that. And the special exception uh, permit doesn't call those out, uh, nor does the letter that, uh, that, that Mr. McCarthy generated uh, in, in conjunction with that. So I, I can't give you any details of why they saw fit. Uh, at the time, uh, 15 years ago, to put that restriction in that special exception permit. My position for purposes of this permit uh, is that it's, it, it's simply contrary to, 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 to zoning principles and, and contrary to, to the, the rules that apply to permits that you could somehow, a, a board could put a condition uh, on a property or some kind of a restriction on the property and that just goes in perpetuity and, and no, no property owner ever could come forward in the future. Uh, and not file an application and seek to have that changed, no, I, I uh, and, and, be, agree, and be evaluated under the under the under the, under the provisions of the zoning ordinance that's in effect at the time that application is being made. I understand, but you're making yeah. my argument. You just said that 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 restriction could be readdressed, but that decision is a decision by the board of supervisors to modify the special exception, not related to the special use that needs to go to the B the BZA. So it seems to me. You, again, you've got the cart before the horse. You need to get the special exception condition relaxed, which is completely viable. I agree with that. But that seems to me to be a necessary step before we can entertain uh, the special use permit for the house that currently has a restriction of no commercial use. Okay. I follow what you're saying now. Thank but you. but I, it seems like we've got the benefit of Mr. Goff and Ms. Summers here this evening. If this has been discussed, do they have any... Thing to add on, on this particular point uh, that might clarify this? Well, uh, actually, Mr. Brown and I sort of passing the night on the details. Uh, I saw some extensive emails today uh, regarding this from Ms. Summers and uh, Mr. Curry, and I would like to have a meeting with Mr. Brown before I find and ask Mr. Curry to tell me to write an opinion on that very question. I mean, the two things, um, very, very simple, non-legal question. Um, Mr. Anderson, who spoke during the public comment period, mentioned this was this house that was sitting there for years, almost to tear down. It's the one where we've been looking at it for years, covered in Tyvek, 
and not finish. That's the same dwelling, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and it's it's, I guess, looking at the plot, it's to it's to the west, to the west of the Blue Rock, kind of closest to the Quaintance Farm. It, it is. Okay. That's right. And then um, currently, the special exception permit that still remains in place on the file for that property is the 2006 SE permit, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Well, what Mr. Mr. Brown is proposing for this is not a commercial use. It's, it's a residential rental. I, I, I think under the under 170-36, it's listed, uh, tourist homes listed as commercial use. I'm not mistaken. It, it's permitted in a residential area, but it is a commercial use. It's a it, by our ordinance. It's a commercial use allowed in a residential area. Okay. So it sounds like, Mr. Goff, you're gonna you are gonna issue an opinion on this because we're talking about basically a dwelling that's embedded within a, a an SE permit permitted property that had it had a particular condition for that particular structure. And I mean, I I was going to use the same phrase uh, Mr. Light was, which is cart before the horrors, because I think all that stands right now is the SE permit. So, the, I mean, I, I also agree with Mr. Light, it would be good to just clean up that SE permit. I, I frankly would be glad to see something other than a half-finished aberration on the landscape. And frankly, that, that part of the county has a number of them. And to take to take one away and actually have it look decent would benefit everyone. So in that sense, um, it makes sense. And I, I do think though that we there has there has to be some cleanup on the one permit that stands in the file, which is the SE permit. So um, does anybody? I mean, that this goes to the board. That go to the. Well, it CCA. would if. Yeah, I mean, a, a special ex exception permit application would eventually go to the Board of Supervisors. But special I think use. A special use goes to the BZA. BZA. Yeah, that would, that would go to the BZA, but um, it seems to me I would agree with Mr. Light that the, the SE permit condition for that dwelling has to be resolved first. I, I would be inclined to, that certainly would be my instinct that you've got a special exception permit and if it if it's not current then I maybe it needs to be current you know based on what mr. some have suggested that maybe that's not current but but yeah you have a special exception permit that the board has issued um, and you're coming in with a special use permit that would go directly to the BZA and seem to, to skip over what the board has imposed on this so I nor do I understand why this this provision was in here, but it seems pretty clear that it was. It says no transient occupancy related to in conjunction with the Blue Rock in operations, which is exactly what you're asking for. It appears so. I, I also would be curious as to. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it'd be a perfect tourist home. It, it's not going to affect anyone. Well, it's a long driveway in there, and it's. Um, uh, if, go ahead. If this uh, special exception uh, permit, if the use wasn't put into place within two years. Is not permit and then void, so there's not a special right. exception on it anymore. Well, then you shouldn't be building. I think it has to be substantially started within the time. Sure. Well, here it is, seven, you know, here it is 15 years later. Well, then if it's the it's operating void, then you can't have a second well. So yeah. It's not good either way. <laughs> Do we have the authority to proceed on that, the modification of that? Special exception. We don't have an application for that. Um, he could verbally give us one. I, I guess no. I, I don't know if we do no. or don't, but I no. don't understand the basis. I don't. I don't know the background as to why there was this very specific provision put in here. I, my assumption is that for whatever reason, they did not want the Blue Rock Inn to be extended. You know, by building this other building, I, I, but you know why? I think it why was that was? I don't likely know. Likely just something the applicant volunteered. I think I think we need to give Mr. Goff a chance to to give us an opinion um, because it is a pretty oddball fact pattern. Um, does anybody Does anybody want to put forward a motion? 
I, in any form, just so I might we move try. It. Okay. I, I move that we table this subject to resolution of the question of applicability of the special exception permit and its restriction on commercial use of the of the subject property. I think that sounds about right. Anyone wish to second that? I'll, I'll second. You you second that. I'll second. It. Okay, uh, Mr. Light made the motion and Ms. Ishii seconded. And so we're tabling it to get an opinion for you. Yeah. Can I interpret just one thing? Sure. It, 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 rather than use the term table, could, could, could the motion be amended just to carry it over to the next meeting? I'm sure that Mr. Goff and I are going to have an opportunity to confer and have something uh, with the expectation that we'll be back before yeah. you. I, uh, I know you've had you've had table right. on your table the, the, before. The, 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 the but table issue we, becomes... We did get it off the table the last time. Yes, so you did. I have no... no. Right. But um, on behalf of the applicant, I'd, I'd respectfully request that, that it simply be carried over uh, to your next fairly scheduled meeting. I don't think it makes any difference. I'll, that's, I'll, I'll, that's I'll fine. concede to that in the, in the spirit of being cooperative. Thank you, Mr. White. Okay. I appreciate I'll, it. Amended motion to carry it over and not table it. I'll, I'll second the amended motion. Okay, Mr. Cole or Mr. Light made the motion. Any further discussion? All right, those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. I Thanks. appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, um, our final substantive uh, matter for this evening is uh, the ongoing discussion and consideration of a zoning amendment for the signed provision of our zoning ordinance. And I think the goal tonight is to hear from Ms. Summers and Mr. Goff and Mr. Curry on where we stand currently on the review of our sign ordinance. And then um, hopefully one or more of us can provide them with some direction as to where we want to go next and uh, go from there. Um, Ms. Summers, do you want to just get us started in this discussion, please? Yeah, sure, Mr. Chairman. Um, on board, I'm staff board up. We provided you with an uh, outline of the current sign ordinance and what we have identified as areas that need to be amended. Um, if you begin with the section of definitions, um, include most definitions, ensure definitions for the main categories of signs, manner of construction are listed so the location size, etc., can be enumerated in later sections, um, such as wall sign, freestanding sign. Those type of definitions need to be in that portion, and the definition for building such items as a real estate sign should probably be removed. Um, if you keep going down, um, the next se section was the permit number. Um, this code section, the permit shall be identified, shall be indicated for each sign for which a permit is required by this article. Permits are not assignable or transferable. By the name permit holder, um, that doesn't make a lot of sense, and you know that doesn't really need to be amended. Prohibited signs. Um, again, prohibitions can consider sign cannot consider the sign message. Um, we, it needs to be dependent upon the zoning district in which the sign is located. Temporary signs again the same thing. Going over to non-conforming signs, um, I'm not really for sure if a non-conforming sign was not registered or not, if that doesn't um, strip someone of their vested right, so that language should probably be amended as well. And then in your resource preservation and residential zones and commercial and industrial districts, um, the commission needs to decide, you know, what's the maximum size that they want for that district? What's the maximum number of signs that folks are allowed to have a pipe? setback on limitations. Um, so that's just a rough run through of the outline that we have prepared. Mr. Goff, uh, would you be willing to just give us some uh, some broader context? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what staff is pressing and asking for is uh, uh, to make a transition from the subject matter of the signs to the type of signs. What a sign says basically is none of our business. 
But what is our business is how big a sign, how tall a sign. How far back from the road is the sign? How is it illuminated? And this is by district, by zoning district. Obviously, uh, you may want to allow a larger sign in an industrial and commercial district than you will with a residential district uh, or a farm sign. That's the direction that we need from the Planning Commission. Once we know what the parameters are, we'll put the words to it. We'll actually give you the detailed stuff. You don't need to worry about that. But what we want to hear is, okay, district by district, and I suggest that you start with your most sensitive use district, which is going to be your residential, your conservation, your ag, and then you move up into the resident, uh, village residential and then into the highway stuff and the industrial and commercial stuff. You need to decide how big a sign. And it's got to be all the same for all those signs. Uh, I'm looking at the ordinance as it is now, and you've got a sign for a monastery or a convent that is a lot bigger than four, uh, or smaller than a subdivision sign, and you got to scratch your head and you got to say, why? I mean, because remember, the Reed v. Town case is all about what are the evils that we're trying to prevent and what are the values we're trying to, to actually uh, enhance property values that's a legitimate zoning goal okay you don't want to have in an industrial commercial zone signs that are only one by one that would reduce the value of the commercial property because you can't advertise what you're selling but if you're going to allow an eight four by eight or even bigger in an industrial commercial zone by the same token that would be noxious in a residential setting okay you don't need to have a sign that says, you know, this is Art Goff's house at 1698 Richmond Road, being four by eight, okay? And you don't need that certainly in the town of Washington, or well, in town, we don't do that, but in Sperryville and Flint Hill and whatnot. So district by district, it's gotta be narrowly tailored to what you're trying to do. Preservation of property values, and also to, to keep a distraction to the motoring public to a minimum and it can serve the aesthetic values of the community too. Uh, you can limit the types of colors and you can limit the number of colors. You can limit how far back they sit from the road. The other thing we need to know is if you're gonna have signs that are regulated differently for commercial is you need a definition for a wall sign, you gotta decide, are there gonna be pole signs? Are there gonna be wall signs? Then you gotta look at this animated sign uh, definition as well. Right now, the little flutter flags on the side of the road are treated the same as Mr. Sticky Man that, that's, you know, motorized and blown up from the inside. Do you want that? So these are the policy decisions that this board should be making to tell staff what to draft for your final approval to send on to the Board of Supervisors. Um, Michelle has created, I think, a handy kind of a, a, a outline of where to go and if you'll look at the sign ordinance itself it's really not that long and it's not that complicated but it is really outdated mm -hmm. so my first suggestion is come up with your matrix your most sensitive districts to your least sensitive districts and then have a robust discussion about what you really want to allow right now i'll point out there's a couple things that came up this year uh, that were very interesting the first was the Amosville Volunteer Fire Department sign. I, thought, I found that to be very fascinating, but I also found our ordinance to be uh, pretty effective. They could actually apply for a special exception, and then that was a legislative decision for the Board of Supervisors. So it worked. It, it, it went along great. And when they finally decided to make that application after much urging from staff, it was successful, and rightly so. Then the other thing that came up was the political signs. That's the second part of what I want to talk about, or temporary signs. I had an interesting discussion with Mr. Curry today about the hay bale signs. You know, that was very controversial. You know, everything, there was stuff in the paper. And, and so I, I just kind of said, you know, was that a sign or was it a hay bale with paint on it? You know, that's, <laughs> it's it really a sign. So uh, that's something that, that has to be addressed. Do you want to allow such things? Okay. 
Or are all temporary signs going to be no bigger than this? And for what duration? So what's the biggest temporary sign in the county? Hands? Real estate, real estate signs, okay. Now, how long are real estate signs usually up for? Sometimes two, three, four, five years, right? Depending on the size of the property. So uh, that's the kind of thing, the detail where you guys can get into. If you have a real estate sign, um, do you, you know, how big is it? And then how long can it sit there? Uh, any temporary sign. We're not, here again, we've got to remove our mindset from talking about real estate or political and just talk about temporary so is, should there be a mechanism whereby these signs, the temporary signs, can be uh, extended? You know, if you set temporary sign at a certain length of time, one year, whatever it may be, then can the person owning the sign then make an application to the zoning office to get an extension uh, to keep those signs there? Because there's often situations where uh, that may be necessary, even with a construction sign. You know, how long does it take to build, you know, some... 6,000 square foot home way back on a country road. It might take a while. So the construction uh, signs need to also be addressed in a way that, and a, and a mechanism needs to be there for enforcement. Uh, so I don't necessarily suggest that they have to register and apply for permits for every real estate sign. That's gonna be kind of an onerous requirement. But at the same time, uh, we gotta have some way of tracking how long they're gonna be there if you think duration is something that needs to be regulated. It doesn't necessarily have to be. That's the policy decision that this board has to make. Uh, so really what we're looking for from this board is direction. What is permissible, okay? That's what we're looking for. And, and right now, th this is very antiquated. Uh, this go must go back to the 1940s or something, you know, especially talking about convents. Are there convents anymore? I don't know. Mm. I don't think We've so. Wisconsin. There, there may be a few somewhere. They're in France, I know that. But, uh, uh, France and Wisconsin. Yeah, France and Wisconsin. Cheese, <laughs> cheese, cheese country. Okay. So uh, so you're looking at home occupation sign just just here in uh, resource pres preservation residential, six square feet for that home occupation. But then a church bulletin is 20 square feet. And identification signs. Uh, 20 square feet. And then subdivision signs, 12 square feet. Real estate signs, six. Off street parking, four. Why? Don't you have to read the sign to, in order to make that determination as to whether it's permitted under our zoning law? And isn't that inherently a, a content un neutrality? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea here is consistency. If you think that it's acceptable within this community that real estate signs be as big as a sheet of plywood, four by eight, then why isn't it for George Bulletin Board? It's the same thing. Because they all signs pose the same threat to the peace and order or property values of the community, regardless of what they say or what their purpose is. Mr. Curry, you want to add? Uh, I don't know if everybody's hearing. Michelle did print out for you. Uh, I'm just going to come up here and carve into the space near a microphone. I uh, did print out for you a couple sections from some other ordinance that uh, have been updated to add some matrix. They're linked in the uh, this outline. And so you can see the concept where they've identified the different types of signs, whether it be a wall sign, a pole sign, temporary sign, and then adds requirements for them. So that you would have different requirements for different zoning districts or groups of zoning districts. Right now we have groups of zoning districts, resource preservation and commercial. So if you can, as a body, come together and think about well, what type of sign, construction type of sign, uh, which, which different categories you want to define, and that would go into definitions, and then which sorts of limitations should be applied to those signs, how big they are, where they are, where they are relative to the road, uh, how many there are per parcel, then you can begin to build out those matrix, and that would really be the core of your, mm -hmm. of your ordinance. And it, and it would be very helpful from that content perspective. Yes, you have different rules in a residential area than a commercial area, 
But in a commercial area, the rules are the same for everybody. And there may be some unique ways you can look at the location perspective. Um, and you know, we talked today on the phone about uh, residential construction or commercial construction uh, or, or sales. Can you have a location-specific sign requirement linked to properties that are under construction or for sale? That's a location-based requirement. Now, you could have any kind of temporary sign on a parcel that's for construction or, or, or for sale. But maybe the, those parcels can have a different size sign. And you'd have to decide that. And we'd have to decide whether it's defensible if somebody said, well, wait a minute, why come my church, permanent church sign can't be that big and make it a, a bigger sign for construction? So this, those are the things we'll have to work through. So these two, these two matrices are from other localities? So those are, yeah, they're linked in oh, the they're, uh, they're from Arbo Merrill and Gloucester. Mm -hmm. uh, just a couple that I'm poking around on Unicode found. Uh -huh. uh, but you have to take them in a little context of what's around them in their ordinance, but it's the concept that I wanted to make sure you understood that how people are trying to tackle this problem with the contract you take. Yeah. So would it make sense if we if we sat down and had a, a template that was structured perhaps as a hybrid of these or along the lines of a matrix like this, and then we just worked through it? By district, as Mr. Goff said. By yeah, and see, Elvin Merrill, I believe, has several of those tables in their ordinance. If, okay. were, if you pulled it up, you'd see there's one per district or something. I think Gloucester's maybe set up a little bit different. Okay. There's probably 50 different ways this is done. But if you can decide which, how you want to parcel up the county by district in groups, you can do every district different if you wanted to, but you probably have enough similarities you can group them. And the common theme here, as you said, is there's no no content discussion at all. It's all it's all size. And yeah. It's all location. Yeah, you see this table. Yes, it's a directional sign. It's a temporary sign. Okay. it's a pole sign. It's a you know wall sign. Wall sign, pole sign. It doesn't say real estate sign. It doesn't say construction sign. It doesn't say uh, you know produce sign or sale sign. And that gets us that then we're safe. That, then we're safe because everybody gets to put the message they want to on that size sign. Okay. But you may decide pole signs are not allowed in residential areas, period. We just don't want them. Yeah. We do want them in a commercial area. Right. So those are the sort of decisions you make. Or you know, in a residential area, it has to be a monument sign. It can only be six feet off the ground, but it can be whatever square feet. You, okay. you can make those decisions. Of course, this is only going forward. Everything that's out there that's permitted would be had yep. right. Yeah. Clarification. I don't see the document that's on the screen now on Bulldog. It's it's linked in the outline. So if you look in the outline. In oh in the outline, which is oh the outline. Okay, so they're linked in there. And does that also answer my second question, which is about these the footnotes? Yeah. So you dig into those. Okay. We can get through it through there. Okay. I got you. Thank you. How would we handle unpermitted signs? I mean, I know they're all over the place. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, the Rappahannock's just full of them. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're they're supposed to, you know, have gotten a permit, and usually, as I understand it, in other jurisdictions, Westmoreland being one, is that uh, you got to put your permit so a number on the sign when you erect it. But right now, you know, what evidence do we have as to how long ago some of these signs were actually erected? You know, there may be some in them that there's no, they're the oldest person in this county remembers that it was there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what are you going to do with that? It doesn't have a permit, you know, so my advice is leave it alone. Every one becomes a vested rights discussion through an enforcement discussion. Yeah. Has to have deep research, you know. Did uh, Mr. Connick approve it back whenever he was his zoning no. administrator? No. <laughs> Chances are not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but we don't know. You know. Yeah. And so that you can't just go after enforcement until you do that deep dive into the research. We can, and and just say, well, prove prove to me you have a permit. Uh, but that's not a very good way to do business with you know in your business community. So, uh, Mr. Golf. Uh, I don't presume to, to, to know what's best for all the citizens of Rappahannock County, and I don't want to know. I want to hear their input. I think at some point 
we need to have some some citizen input on this good point and, and their opinions and, and I think it's probably one of those things that the sooner you have it the better so should, should when do you think that there should be an, an advertised public input session um, we, people, is there, when yeah to get people's opinions on signs and you know, okay. Whether it be commercial, or be farm signs, produce signs, you know, and all should, these things. And maybe we should we should work through some of the proposed size in zoning district ideas here, so that the public has something on which to comment. Right. Well, that would be my point: is that if we're going to advertise a public hearing, you're going to have to advertise generally what it is that you're proposing to do. When we do the comprehensive plan, we go to each district and just have an input session. Okay, well that's something entirely different from yeah, a public hearing. I, I know, but, but an input session versus before you actually put something on paper to get people jumping up and down about. Okay, and then the other thing that may be of concern there is just make sure that you're noticing this as a meeting mm -hmm. of the planning commission because it would be. Mm -hmm. uh, and even though you may not say a thing, uh, you can't, uh, under the Freedom of Information Act, uh, open meeting requirements, just gather at the fire hall and start to, you know, because it's bound to turn into a, quote, official and, meeting. And I think you're going to have some trouble. It's going to be hard to bring the general public up to speed on you know, why why the rules are what they yeah. are relative yep. to the Reed versus Gilbert. And you, I, I think you almost have to put a straw man out, yep. recognizing that it will not be right. Uh, so... Here are some ideas. Let us know what you think about those ideas so we can shape them to fit what you want. Uh, but I think if you just go blank slate, it's going to be hard for the public to, to provide meaningful com comment. But we know that people can criticize really well. So we give them something to, to, to look at and say, well, that's silly. Why would anybody pick 40 square feet for that? It helps them. But it would be hard for them to come up with 32 is the right number right off the bat. At least well, that's my experience. It's a common sense thing, too. How many people are going to send you emails about the size of a subdivision sign or a, you know, or that, that type of, and here again, if you're talking about a maximum size per district, that's what I think you ought to hash out yep. as a majority of a body and say, here, John Q. Public, we're thinking that we're going to enact or recommend enacting a uh, across the board for this zoning district of four by eight. Okay. Tell us your feedback. Then you might get some feedback. Where you will get the feedback is if you bring up the hay bales, get people's ideas on that, and if you bring up uh, the fluttering and commercial signs. Yep. That's where you're going to get your, your your feedback. And then the temporary signs, most people are used to real estate signs. Everybody wants a real estate sign, especially if they're going to sell or buy a house. So you're not going to have a lot of controversy there. But what you're going to need feedback from the public on is the stuff that may end up being more controversial, yeah. which would include the uh, uh, the fluttering flags and yeah. the stick men and the hay bales. Uh -huh. So, you know, and now do you want to set, you want to cut out something different for hay bales, you know, that's applicable to, to ag and conservation. Mr. Chair, what, if I could, sorry, sorry, did I interrupt? Go ahead, sorry. No. Um, <laughs> I think to get to some balance of this, I, it sounds like, you know, we have some work to do yep. in any event. So it seems to me that a path forward would be uh, a work session that the, the intent of which and the subject of which is clearly advertised and includes a public comment period. And I think that would begin to get whatever uh, free form input people want to share with us as we as we work on it. So I think that might be a little bit of what you're asking for and kind of moving us in the direction of the straw man and we'll sort of yeah. step it up as we go. Yeah, and I do think, and I can work with uh, Ms. Summers and Mr. Goff and Mr. Curry, but I think at least starting with the construct of, of a matrix like they use at Albemarle, so we could come in with some kind of template that would give us a starting point for, so we're not just out there doing amorphous things that are tied to nothing. So we have our existing ordinance and then 
we come in with a blank template and we start talking through it. Um, I'm 0 for 2 on work sessions, one because of weather and one because of a conflict with the budget meeting. Mr. Curry, do you, do you happen to have the schedule for the next few weeks on our budget work sessions for the Board of Supervisors? I just don't want to, it'd be good to have a date certain set tonight um, for a session like the one, Mr. Is there a, is there a Wednesday in there that's open? Like the 31st is a fifth week, so it should be open. 31st to Wednesday? Yes. And we could come in here? Uh, in the evening, yeah. Usually it's not court Wednesday. Okay. We don't have court Wednesday. Okay. So let's, do we need to put that in the form of a motion? I'm not sure. Go ahead, Mr. Well, Light, if you want. I was just going to comment, I, I, you know, if, it, if that is the date that works everywhere, I'm going to be returning from out of town that day, so oh, I'm shoot. a little bit concerned about having it that night. But it, the next, did I hear that the 7th was also available, or was that a conflict? What date? 7th of? The 7th, which would be the next Wednesday. I believe that would be open in this room. Okay, and that would give us time to kind of come up with um, some materials that we could That would be equally amenable, it would certainly be okay. that works. to me. That should work for me. Okay. Just for the record, Mr. Lake, you want to go ahead and put sure. it in the floor? I, I, I move that we schedule a work session for, say, 6 p.m. on Wednesday, November 7th. To, sorry, April. November's fine, too. <laughs> we'll probably have one then, too. Uh, but... Um, for the purpose of uh, advancing the the, the um, development of a, a new sign ordinance. Great. Okay, um, Miss Ishi beat you to it. So thank you very much, Mr. Light. Um, made the motion and Miss Ishi seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Mr. Goff for being here. It was very helpful, Ms. Summers, for for getting us started with with the the column notes and the ordinance of Mr. Curry for the broader context and the research that you did to help us along. So, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second, Mr. Kohler, Mr. Light, second. In favor? Aye. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I I won't say.